This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey there, everybody. It's Rosie. My friends from Vital Work, Rebecca Johnson and Natalie Johnson, passionately help leaders and teams function at full capacity. This new series, Energy, Connection, and Courage at Work, breaks down those three elements essential to a thriving workplace. Take a listen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Energy, Connection, and Courage at Work. I am Natalie, and I am here with Rebecca. And we're here today to start a conversation about courage. This is going to be the first of several conversations about courage because it's a big broad topic and we have a special guest with us today and we tend to talk about courage the most i think in the work that we do when we're talking about leadership but in reality i think we all recognize that courage is necessary and needed as individuals when we're protecting our own well-being and our energy it's also needed in creating true authentic connection with other people creating trust with other people, high-performing teams, and it's especially needed in leadership. And we have had this wonderful opportunity to meet Joe Rea. He is uh, one of the leaders that we've worked with, specifically around courage, with a local client that we have. It's a behavioral health client. And when Rebecca and I started talking about this topic of courage and who we might talk to on our podcast that really represents courage, Joe was one of the first people that came to mind for us. And so with that, Joe, I just want to welcome you here today. Thank you so much. I'm honored that you considered me and uh, happy to share my experience. Yeah, absolutely. And before I hand it over to you, Joe, I just want to share, you know, one of the many things that Rebecca and I noticed in being able to work with you and your team is the impact that it's had on the team and the interactions that you have with your team. We notice that people trust you. And I think maybe for me personally, something that stands out for me is you're not a brand new leader, but you're a kind of new leader and you've had a pretty positive impact from the beginning. And so I'd love to hear from you today. You know, what are what does courage and leadership mean to you? Well, uh, yeah, you know, being new in leadership, this is definitely the highest level leadership role that I've had and the most responsibility that I've had up to this point in my career. And having a team that uh, reports to me of about 110 individuals that over the last year and a half has grown from 40 uh, and in many respects has grown because of the culture that we have created here. It definitely has not been an easy task. And if you were to ask me when I interviewed for this position, what courageous leadership is, I think my answer would be very different than what it is today. Uh, and I think that's because it's different for every person. There's a, uh, a recipe or a formula that you can try to follow that we'll talk a little bit about today. But every single person is driven by different values. And the key is how do those values drive you and whether or not those values align with the leadership position that you're in. You know, when we had the opportunity to learn from you all and talked about the Dare to Lead concept and courageous leadership as it was, one of the things that really resonated with me was not only practicing self-awareness, but leading with integrity. And I'd heard the term before, as many of us have, we've heard what integrity is. And uh, ironically, many people define it differently. But um, even as some of our leaders defined what integrity was, we saw that there were some common themes there. And the one that resonated with me the most was doing what you say and saying what you mean. And for me, That is the real foundation of what I would consider courageous leadership, knowing that what you truly mean has to be what you say, and then what you say has to be how you act. As in many situations, as leaders, we have to make very difficult decisions between what our own personal morals and ethics may tell us to do, what our own personal values may tell us to do, and what may be our own leadership or our own climate is asking us to do. So I definitely feel that courageous leadership has changed for me over the last couple of years that I've been here. Um, And I'd like to share a couple of quick stories that are really impactful for me. 
and helped me shape what courageous leadership is. And one is an anecdote that was given to me by uh, one of our senior leaders here at the company I'm working for now. And he shared with me that he had a friend um, who was in a particular religious organization and um, was going there, but he himself was gay or is gay. And knowing that he was going there consistently, he asked him, you know, they're out about not supporting you in homosexuality. They're, they're out about not supporting LGBTQ plus community. Why do you continue to go back there knowing that they give you sideways looks or don't accept you for who you are? And the answer was pretty profound. And, you know, some people may feel this is common sense, but I think this is, again, extremely courageous because the individual turned back and said, well, I have two options. I can either walk away to make myself comfortable or I can stay in the fire and try to make change from within. And by making that change from within, his perspective was, I could show people that what they think about me isn't necessarily true. And that kind of stuck with me because I started thinking about sometimes the very difficult political climate we work with. I mean, I'm in behavioral health. It's relatively a progressive field. Uh, but we're in a pretty conservative area. So some of the initiatives that we try to push across aren't always welcomed by the community or even are conducive to the politics in the area. And so the question is, do I as a leader decide to go somewhere else where maybe my vision and my values are accepted and maybe even celebrated? Or do I try to deal with the difficulty here and make that change from within? And uh, that story has really driven me to continue to see my vision through. And thankfully it has, because there are some days where it's very, very difficult, but it, it definitely has. And so before this role, uh, I had worked and spent a, a good amount of time in the criminal justice system, working with individuals with behavioral health and substance use disorders. And I came across a particular situation where there were some decisions that were being made that were, uh, in, in my opinion, pretty unethical. And they weren't necessarily my decisions to make by any means, but I did not feel comfortable with them because they impacted somebody else's freedom and impacted somebody else's life. And it's something I'm very conscientious about, whether I'm teaching at the university level or guiding some of our staff here, is that everything that we do is related to an individual's life and a human being's life in this field. And so we need to take that seriously. And, and I felt that this particular situation uh, really discounted that individual. And the, the consequence to that person was that they were going to have their freedom restricted. And so I brought it up to one of our judicial leaders at the time in a one-on-one -on -one conversation and just expressed my concern about it. And I uh, was pretty surprised by the answer. The answer was, hey, um, you're not wrong here, but I got to ask you, do you want to just have a nice, comfortable career and not rock the boat? Or do you want to ask questions and have people wonder whose side you're on? And I didn't know how to respond at the time. But it's a story, again, like the other, that I continue to carry with me because I think about, do I want to kick the beehive? Do I want to have a comfortable career or do I not? And that kind of leads me to what I spoke about at the beginning, which is courageous leadership is different for everybody because it depends on your vision. It depends on what you want to be and what you want your legacy to be. And over the time that I've been here with this current company, I've decided that for me, at the end of the day, my personal vision is to leave a legacy of positive change for the people who are most vulnerable and to teach others to do that, to develop the next generation, to continue that um, particular mission. And so because of that, I am uh, relatively comfortable kicking the beehive. And it has not been an easy journey to get there. Uh, it still is not an easy journey when I do that at times. But I, I know that the reason I'm doing it is not a selfish one. It's to further that vision and to, again, leave that lasting legacy and that lasting impact for individuals who really need us to be the leaders in the community for them. Joe, there's this thing that keeps occurring to me as you're talking and the word that keeps coming up is discomfort. And so I want to run something by you and just get your reaction to it, which is when you think about doing the courageous thing at work or anywhere in your life, it inherently means that you have to experience some discomfort or some fear, right? Like it wouldn't be a courageous act if there wasn't some discomfort around it. 
And so I'm thinking about there's a little bit of nuance around that discomfort. Number one, we have to learn how to sit with the discomfort that a courageous act usually requires. But also I'm thinking that sometimes we have to learn how to understand what the discomfort is telling us, meaning sometimes we're going to feel uncomfortable and we're going to choose to do the thing anyway because it's right and even though it brings some risk. And sometimes we're going to feel uncomfortable and decide right now I'm not willing to take the risk that that courageous act would mean because maybe I don't have enough positional power or I'm worried about judgment that could end my career or whatever. So I'm curious, how do you make the determination for yourself about when you're willing to risk it or not? You know, I had a situation here when I first started, which actually cemented the fact that I know I'm working for the right company. Those who are listening who are familiar with Behavioral Health Net know that some of the challenges uh, with spending are related to what you can spend on. We had a situation where we were working with a homeless family. We had been able to relocate them or, or gather some funding to relocate them to a different state uh, to be with family, which was more of a long-term solution for them. The challenge was that all of the guidelines and funding essentially said we could not buy them any type of food, but they were about to get on a two-day bus trip to this other state and had nothing. And I went to my uh, executive leadership and spoke with them about it. And I said, listen, I said, we can't, we can't, from a humanistic standpoint, we cannot leave them with nothing. And I was very surprised that from three different senior leaders, the answer was, we need to do what's right by them and we'll work out the details later. And right then I knew I was in the right place because it is a risk. Now that's a minor one in comparison. It's a financial risk that we can, uh, we can figure out how to make up for. That's not a huge deal, but that's a good example of how I realized that this is a company that aligns with my vision of taking risks when it is the right thing. But then defining the right thing can be different by each person as well. So what's right for me may not be right for another leader. For me, what's right is understanding that we work with people who are humans, who have wants and needs, and doing everything we can to try to get them to a place where they can empower themselves to fulfill those wants and needs. And that can be a bit of a challenge for us. So when I think about what's right and I consider taking a risk, it always comes down to, is this benefiting the population I'm trying to serve? Is this self-serving? Is this organization serving? Is this system serving? And for me, I can rest my head on the pillow at night if I know that what I did and what I advocated for and what I asked my team to advocate for was for the right thing for the person, the human being who needed that. We've had some challenges with that. But in most cases, the feedback generally from my team and from the people that we serve is one of gratitude because we are focusing on that particular piece. So I'm comfortable taking risks when it's going to result in the betterment of somebody who truly needs help. As you were talking, I'm I'm envisioning you you know, stepping into the fire and kicking the beehive. And I love that you have such a clear vision of the leader you want to be and why that's needed and necessary for you. I'm curious, when you are kicking the beehive, when you are stepping into the fire and doing the difficult thing, and it doesn't go well. So for example, what if in your situation, your example, the response that you got wasn't, we're going to do the right thing by the people. What if the response was, we need to follow the rules? We need to follow procedures and protocol. Is there anything that's helpful for you when you're in those situations where it's requiring courage and it doesn't really feel like things are going well while you're in the fire? I don't give up. I think when I get that answer, you know, and not in a disrespectful way, but it's okay to challenge a no. It's okay to ask like, hey, can we revisit that regulation? Can we take a look at where that's written and then maybe go back to the individuals who are responsible for that regulation in that situation, hypothetically. Let's say we did get a no. My next call would have been to our funding source to say, well, or I would have said to our senior leaders, would you mind if I explore this a little bit more? And I can guarantee you they would have said yes. I would have gone to the funding source and I would have explained the situation and said, is there a way we can make an exception in this case? And here's the reason. Now, again, I could go down the 
the hypothetical rabbit hole here with nose and nose. But at the end of the day, if we couldn't do it, I don't know. There may have been a possibility that uh, one of us or maybe even myself may have thrown a gift card out there to make that happen. But um, I'm fortunate that even if I had to take it to the funding source, given the situation, I'm very, very confident that we would have been able to get that across. But uh, there are going to be times where I, I may kick a beehive or, or step into the fire and get burned or get stung or get a no. And that's that's the risk. You know, I think you have to do it strategically in a way that you're not being disrespectful to your leadership or burning bridges with your funding sources or even your staff members, because there is a negative aspect to advocating too hard or having people see you advocate a little bit too passionately when it's not necessarily the hill to die on. But uh, yeah, I think that's all that's all part of taking that risk. Joe, one of the, you know, this podcast is about energy connection and courage and the reason that those are the three words we focus on in our work is because we feel like they're kind of the key to transforming individuals and teams and organizations. And so anytime we have a conversation with someone about one of them, we always like to connect the dots between the other two. So I'm curious, how are those three words connected? Like how are individual energy, team connection, and courage in the workplace connected from your perspective? Well, I think they all come down to vulnerability, realistically. Um, courage requires vulnerability. Energy requires vulnerability. That is actually personally identified as one of the areas that I try to be conscientious about, as evidenced by the 12-ounce Red Bull next to me. But it's not necessarily about <laughs> caffeine. Um, but it, it is truly about making sure you have the energy to get through, as Brene says, the suck be able to embrace that and get through that, uh, having the mental and emotional energy to continue to push forward when sometimes you do get those no's or when uh, somebody else kind of stomps on your vision. And so when I look at my team and the team that I'm fortunate to have built here, I think about the fact that when I don't have that energy, for me, I need to get up from my desk and I need to walk around and talk to some of my folks because the connection that we have refills some of my energy. And then I'm able to kind of get back to remembering, okay, the administrative stuff, terrible, don't like it. I didn't get an answer I like today, but you know what? We're still doing the right thing. And I look at these folks and they're passionate and they're empowered and they feel like they're growing. And that again is how I refill some of my cup because I feel like I'm doing the right job. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I did not have that connection with them. And the reason I have that connection is because I feel that I've been able to be vulnerable and courageous with them. I will let them know when something doesn't go right. I have no problems telling them, hey, listen, I tried this. It didn't work. Let's game plan back together and allow them to give me some of their input, regardless of what position they are. Um, I've had that as some consistent feedback from folks that they, they don't necessarily feel that they're here in a hierarchy. And I think that's a hallmark of some of our leadership and the culture that we've got in this area because... Everybody is valued. Everybody has a different role, but your opinions are valued and your experience is valued. And that's what creates the connection that, again, drives that energy, at least for me. And I, I believe for some others, too. Joe, you know, one of the things that we like to offer at the end of our podcast is a, a one big thing to walk away with. What is, what is one big thing that you would like our listeners to maybe take with them or focus on in terms of being more courageous in their life? One of the things that I think is very important for a leader is practicing your values versus just professing them. You know, I think we've all been around or looked up to or been led by somebody who's a really good speaker or a really good talker. Um, but over time, we realize that the vision doesn't necessarily become reality or they're not doing as much to drive or maintain that vision. And it's easy for us to talk about transparency and leading with the heart and creating a supportive culture, but all of them are very, very difficult. So it's extremely important for a leader to demonstrate that you're vulnerable, that you're transparent, rather than just saying it. Because again, you're observed all of the time. I like to think about a concept called the shadow of the leader, where whether consciously or unconsciously, your team is watching you and they will react in a way that they see you react. Some because they're looking up to you as a leader, and I'm sure we can all go back to people we looked up to and tried to emulate 
as we grew, but how you react, especially in challenging situations, is exactly how they're going to react because they're going to see that as the way, especially if they believe in you. So the one big thing that I think is important to share is to share with your team when you fail. Embrace that failure. Share the setbacks. People don't need a leader who believes and projects that they know everything because that person doesn't exist. That organization doesn't exist. You know, we, we work in behavioral health and behavioral health, just by nature of what it is, is an inexact science. We have best practices, we have standards, but we do the best we can with what we've got. And even in the medical realm, the same thing occurs. So a good leader needs to be able to demonstrate that they don't know everything and feel comfortable sharing when they've made a bad decision. And it, it stinks, it hurts. It hurts the ego, but those bruises, you'd be surprised how easily they get healed when you have your team around you in support of you. And so not only sharing those setbacks is important, but also demonstrating what you learned from it, how you are going to readjust your plan, or frankly, if you don't know, inviting them to game plan with you, inviting them to say what they think we could do in that situation. Again, you'd be surprised with how many people are willing to follow somebody who allows them to be a part of that leadership. And then understanding that leadership is not a position. Leadership is the way that somebody impacts others. And so realizing that everybody from your administrative staff all the way up to your CEO are in a position of leadership helps them feel that they are having that impact that they are in this field to have. So again, that one big thing for me, share those setbacks, let your staff learn from you, let your team learn how you respond when things are difficult and let them be there to help you game plan. You know, these things are super important because not only does it help us demonstrate the practice of courageous leadership, but it casts that shadow of trust and accountability that helps you drive a healthy culture and innovate, which is really what we're all trying to do at the end of the day. And it really shows why failure is a necessary part of growth. You know, I think we're, we're all afraid. We go back to that fear and anxiety, but if we don't fail, we don't grow. And if you pretend you're not failing, then you're just faking yourself out because you're not growing. Mm -hmm. We have this client. It's actually another behavioral health client we work with. It just occurred to me that you're both in the same industry, but we do some coaching with their executive leaders. And one thing they shared with us that they do that I thought was awesome is that they have this all team meeting once a month. And one of the five people on the C-suite team purposefully shares a mistake and a learning they had. So you know, the CEO, the COO, the CFO, one of them will share, here's what I did this past month that it turns out was a mistake. Here's what we learned from it. And I thought that was such a good way of demonstrate, just like you're saying, demonstrating for the team that mistakes are normal and to be expected. And the best thing we can do is learn from them. And I think of those leaders as some of the most courageous that we work with. So I love that you chose that one and although it sounds kind of maybe, you know, easy and simple for many people, it is not easy at all to admit mistakes. But I think you're right that that's the gateway to connection. And that is an actual demonstration of courage. Thank you for that. Of course. So that brings us to the very last part of our show. And we still, after, I don't know, eight or nine episodes, don't have a name for it. I used to call it the secret, <laughs> but that got vetoed. <laughs> It's just like, we just like to humanize things and share one thing about ourselves that most other people don't know. Um, sometimes Natalie and I share things that even we don't know about each other. Um, it can just be anything, a little thing, a big thing. So I don't have one in mind, which means I'm going to ask Natalie or Joe, who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go first only because this is not an interesting thing about me personally necessarily, but it was kind of a unique thing that happened to me about two weeks ago. I was speaking in Iowa. And in the middle of a, a fairly large keynote event, there were tornado warnings coming in. And so large groups of people were running out of the room and I had no idea what was going on. And then I went to the airport immediately after to cap catch my plane and we were evacuated to the basement of the airport because of tornadoes. And so that was an interesting 
experience to be in the basement of an airport with hundreds of people because there's a tornado outside. So, you know, the 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 fun in in our travel schedule and that stands out to me today cuz that kind of cascaded into a whole bunch of travel issues, but that was a first for me. I think too that that was a first being in the basement of an airport. Maybe a last, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know that going to an airport would be my first place to go if I knew there were tornadoes coming, but that's definitely courageous. Yes, exactly. Um, Well, let's see. Let's see. One interesting thing. So uh, some people do know this about me, but I have been a singer for a number of years and uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to sing for some uh, really cool crowds. When I was in college, I um, was a keynote singer, I guess. I don't know what you call those, but featured singer for um, our uh, college board of trustees, which included some senior executives out of New York City. And that was kind of neat. And uh, look back at that experience and really enjoy it. And I have been doing music ever since. So I am uh, currently in a band and play around town a few times uh, a few times a month. And that's my outlet. Joe, you have to let us know where you are. Yeah. This is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, my uh, my band is called the Night Owls. We're just a little local dance band, so uh, a lot of fun. And uh, again, really, really great outlet. Great name, love the it. Night Owls. I love that. All right, I'll go something simple. Uh, Natalie, you know this, but most people don't. I just turned 50 this month, and that was a big marker, as it is for most people. But one I feel really good about, I'm loving 50. Well, the, the mindset and the heart. I'm not loving the wrinkles, but... <laughs> I love the mind and heart of being 50. <laughs> I'd take my 30-year-old body. But anyway, um, my mom planned a surprise party for me that was so um, awesome and thoughtful. So I am 50 and feeling very loved and happy to be here. Well, happy belated birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. And, and I'll right. only add in one tiny thing that I think you've mentioned on a podcast previously, but I think we have to mention it because Joe was mentioning kicking the beehive. Rebecca has bees also. Yes. Rick, Rebecca has bees. The podcast regularly now knows that I love birds and we have bees. <laughs> Good. My husband has a full-on beekeeper suit, like the hat, the whole getup. Really... <laughs> well, you'll be happy to know okay. I metaphorically kick beehives, not literally. All right, Joe. We well, thank really you. appreciate your time. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode of Energy Connection and Courage. Bye, everyone. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com, and of course, hit that follow button.